Hi everyone and welcome to this mini lecture of uh, ongoing series called What is Popular Culture? And this mini lecture is focused on looking at a particular example of popular culture. Within this mini series we've tried to look at a bunch of different ideas about where popular culture is, what it is, what you do with it, all of those things. And in this one we're going to take a look at a specific example. And so the specific example I decided to choose was coffee. Uh, I know some people don't drink coffee, but many people in American culture certainly do drink coffee. Uh, and I think what's fascinating is there's so many different types of elements around this idea of drinking coffee. There's different types of coffee drinkers. And coffee is part and parcel of our culture and part and parcel of our popular culture. So this mini lecture is going to take a look at that and going to have us have a conversation around what do we talk about when we talk about coffee. So many of us do, but others don't know that coffee comes from beans. And even coffee beans, right, that even before they become the grinds that become soaked with water that become the coffee drink, the beans themselves raise a variety of questions about how people identify. First of all, some people don't even think about the beans, and others do. Some people prefer one type of bean over the other. Some people prefer those beans be flavored. Some people prefer that those beans be picked by people that are paid paid uh, respectful or paid with a with a respectable respectable wage compared to what um, others are paid so you might you know that that's under the auspices of uh, fair trade so just even before people get to the cup there's a variety of ways in which people think about or potentially think about their coffee they may want their coffee shade grown because of the environmental impact so there are these different ways in which we connect to the coffee well before it ever gets into our cup. And then when it does get into our cup, of course, then we're looking at and thinking about the different ways in which we drink our coffee, right? Some people are going to want to just have their straight black coffee. Other people are going to want it with two lumps of sugars. Some people are going to want their coffee to be a bit more elaborate. So they're going to have a combination of things. You know, they're going to have a mocha, soy, latte, put in whatever here. Um, and those kind of things start to t tell us about how people connect with their coffee, you know, and what it means or what they communicate about themselves by saying, I drink this type of coffee or I can't live without my, you know, my soy frappe every day. So this is, a, this is an interesting dynamic, you know, the size or the amount of coffee that we drink. Uh, sometimes certain coffee drinkers get into this debate of like, oh, well, I drink X amount of cups of coffee and I drink this amount of cups of coffee. So even just the act of drinking it uh, brings up a variety of things about how people identify and how people connect with that coffee. And in our culture, this coffee is ubiquitous. It is everywhere. In fact, in many towns and places in New England, you can mark distance and you can tell people directions by the amount of Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks that they run into. And that brings up the next question, or br that brings up the next idea is that it's ubiquitous because it is so highly commercialized in that people start to brand identify with certain chains. You know, some people are, are you know, hardcore Starbucks fans and other people need their Dunkin' Donuts and can't live without it. Other people want their Tim Hortons. So there's this variety of, you know, chains in that people identify with each, and we have different expectations of each. You know, if we go to Starbucks, people are going to expect Wi-Fi, they're going to expect somewhat comfortable seats and as a place to, you know, chat and hang out with people, whereas Dunkin' Donuts, more people seem to think of it or see it as something they go through. You don't want to spend time there. Um, you, ex you know, at Starbucks, you have baristas. And there's a question or there's some interesting questions had around what happens when you start calling your, your wait staff something different. Um, how does that change the relationship? And of course, people form relationships with their local coffee place, right? They start to become a regular and that person, you know, starts to expect when they come in, the, the person that's working on the other side of the, the the counter will know their drink, will order their drink, will, you know, spell their name right if they put their name on their cup. So there's some interesting things that go on in expectations and relationships and all of this just from coffee. And then, of course, we get into, as I said, the, the you know, the, the very elaborate drinks. We get into making coffee at home. We get into this idea of coffee is something that goes with everything. It can be something to wake you up. It can be something as a dessert at the end of the day. Uh, so it starts, we start to have these gadgets and we start to have these tools that help us 
connect even more with our coffee. And we start to see coffee places, as I mentioned with Starbucks, but just even coffee shops in and around um, that are considered independent coffee shops, they start to become what are called third spaces, places for people to go to do work, right? To kind of work in a place that is not their home and not their their office per se, but this third space. Um, they go there to socialize, to meet, to hang out, to listen to performances and things like that. So we start to see you know, all of this being tied to coffee, an entire social scene, an entire um, you know, life dynamic that is coffee. And we get other places, you know, we get <laughs> coffee on the go that we start to see coffee becoming more and more part of our daily routines to the point at which you know there's expectations that places that either coffee will come to us or that we have the tools to carry our coffee everywhere so if we think about cars and we think of oh what do we have there we always have those coffee holders and we think about the various containers and thermoses that we now expect to have and to find and to use everywhere um, and then we get these these different coffee like drinks, right? So we've gotten coffee, and now we're get we have this whole range of coffee like drinks that are usually some kind of mixture of um, coffee with other things. And now it comes in a can, and now we can start you know storing it. Instead of making it, storing it, and therein lies a different relationship with coffee from the coffee you make or have someone make to coffee that comes in a can. And then finally, we get to the point in which you know we we start to defy the origins of or, or, or kind of the natural tendencies that we have with coffee. And I I have a picture of an ice co of iced coffee here because we find people increasingly now, even during the winter, are ordering iced coffee. And so it's the, this interesting, you know, it becomes so relevant, so part of our lives, and yet we find all the different ways to integrate it in some ways that are not so common. And we get even personalized coffee or we get into this, this situation where we have the Keurig cups. And these are those one cup. And with these, people go from, again, this mass production of, of coffee as part of the coffee shop and things like this to the one personalized cup for you, right? I want this type of cup and you know, my roommate wants this type of cup and my coworker wants this type of cup. And so it really starts to personalize the coffee experience as to what I specifically want, which, you know, is an interesting piece in the whole picture of popular culture because so much of it is about personalizing or the personal connection. All right, so coffee is popular culture. A couple questions or things to be thinking about. Um, how do we as individuals identify with coffee? As I said previously, you know, some people that is part of their identity. They can't function, they can't go to work, they can't do these things until they've had their coffee. Uh, what does it mean to be a coffee drinker? Right, so if somebody says, yeah, I, I drink coffee, uh, there's often a lot of associations that come with that. There's a lot of expectations, and those expectations are, of course, painted in part through popular culture. We have a variety of characters who we can see as connected to coffee or being coffee drinkers, or you know, that's part of their routine. They get together and have coffee. Uh, certainly, Seinfeld made this very popular, where they would meet in the diner, and they'd all be drinking their coffee. How do how does coffee shop how do coffee shops become a locus of popular culture? And again, I just mentioned Seinfeld, but there's a variety of other shows where the you know the characters uh, meet together at a coffee shop. There's the idea that coffee shops are perpetuators of popular culture. Uh, they host local bands. They host a variety of activities within that area, and they also encourage people to come in. So they they serve as the socio cultural center of the area or one of the socio-cultural centers of the area. How does coffee selection speak about my identity? And again here, you know, if you think about what if you do drink coffee, what does it say that you order one type of coffee versus another? What does it mean if you order your coffee all black, that you don't take sugar? What does it mean if you order it with a shot of espresso on top of what the coffee is? Um, so be you know it's interesting to look at how that 
speaks about what we think about ourselves or others. And then how does coffee, or what does coffee seem to symbolize as a cultural good? And I think this is very interesting. This is again where we get into really the deeper talk about popular culture and that is, you know, how does, what does it mean to be a coffee drinker and what does that symbolize um, in terms of cultural goods? Not cultural good as in good or bad, but a cultural good as in some kind of, you know, marker of exchange. Uh, and so what does it? And I would encourage you to think about this and consider, you know, in your own head, whether it's coffee or it's alcohol or it's cigarettes, how do these things as popular culture and our investment in them or our, our you know, our dislike of them communicate things about us in, in the larger popular culture? All right, that's all for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.